Shut everything down. Good. Okay. All right. Welcome, everybody. It is Friday. It is the first Friday of the month, which means we're reviewing the jobs report here with Dr. Riley White, finance professor at the University of New Mexico. You've seen him. You've heard him. He's here to offer his jobs, the jobs report analysis every single first Friday, along with a special topic. This month, we're going to be talking about 2022 predictions that he has for the months ahead. We've already experienced about a month, and so I think there's enough data to just see what's ahead, uh, in addition to all the other good stuff and your questions. So without further ado, Dr. White, I'm going to hand it over to you for your usual amazingness. Oh, Albert, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, so grateful to be here for the awesome introduction and the one I do not deserve. It is such an honor to be here uh, for you all today uh, to talk about the jobs report and to get a sense of what's going on, what's happening, and, and uh, uh, sort of make some sense out of some, some big picture questions that we've seen so far. Uh, it's been an interesting year. So what we're going to do is kind of make a little bit of a prediction for 2022. And you are very welcome to call me out on any poor prediction that I make later on through the year, especially if it seems like it's not happening. So so like any true uh, finance or economics uh, uh, type person, I'm hedging my bets and trying to make it happen. So let's go back in the jobs report. Here in celebration of this, I have my Albert's List uh, goblet, also known as my joblet. Uh, where we're going to talk a little bit about, <laughs> can I get this endorsed as an Albers List official thing? I Your job list, that's, that's great. I bought this, I like it was like at Home Goods for six bucks, and then I shellacked it so I can drink out of it. I might be poisoned, but it's just water. Anyway, uh, let's see if we can do this. So I'm going to bring it up here. Uh, I actually didn't rename it. It says December jobs report on my share screen. I'm going to rename this quickly. So even though I just I just wrote over my previous file in a very big way, but let me make this a little bit... It's the details. So let me go back here and I'll share my screen. Ba -dum -bum -bum. Okay, so let's go back here so you should be able to see it. I'll leave it open like this. Also, if you have questions, I encourage you as always to answer them in the chat window. I'm here to answer, here to ask, here to do anything with your Q&A. Uh, uh, no such thing as a too silly of a question. Uh, but as we go through this, we're gonna do kind of our initial jobs report breakdown followed up into our 2022 outlook to see what we should prepare for. And we're looking at a few things. So anyway, let's talk. What a ride it's been. And those of you who are looking at your stock portfolio right now, what an interesting couple of weeks it's been, especially in the tech sector. You saw Amazon stock come back rapidly. What is the market going to do this year? We're going to talk a little bit about that. Notice, of course, my caveat to this, when we make projections, none of this is qualified financial advice. I do want you to understand this is uh, for the purpose of this, an academic presentation aimed and at entertainment and entertainment. But uh, let's take it from there. That's my little liability thing. All right. So the jobs report. So guess what? Surprise. Uh, normally we haven't, it's been a while since we've had a good news surprise. <laughs> This was a big one. We had 467,000 jobs created. We, that's that's way higher, 300,000 jobs greater than our consensus estimate was. Another estimate that you'll find today, and one moral that I want you to think about in this situation, is how bad people whose job it is predicting things, including mine are, at actually predicting things. But there's some explanations to this that make this a little bit more nuanced. Um, and I kind of want to go over a few details into this as well. So the good news, uh, 467,000 jobs. And the jobs report, if you remember last month, we said that the jobs report, which came in around 200K, was very disappointing. It was very disappointing for December and for our jobs report. We began to look at and look into the future and question whether or not, um, you know, is this indicative of a general slowing? Is this because of uh, uh, the COVID-19 variant du jour uh, affecting all of our lives. And uh, what they did is they, they run, when economists do this, this research and they do these things, they often, more information comes in. Uh, they remodel some data. They make some adjustments. One of them is based on population models and population growth. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But they upward revised the December jobs estimate plus 300,000 jobs. So we, we came in in December. If you remember our early January report, if you happen to be there for attendance, we came in and said this was disappointing. Actually, they're saying we had a half million jobs that were generated. The entire theme 
my entire intonation of that entire presentation would have been vastly different if we had if I had a half million dollar jobs number at the time. But this is par for the course with predictions. Um, and, and like any good analyst, you should revise based on new information that happens. Uh, we also revised uh, an aggregate of 398,000 uh, in November. Those are huge numbers. I'll show you a graph a little bit uh, about this. I tried to think of puns for most of my slides, and, and then they get incredibly terrible as time goes on. Unemployment, though, and this is interesting. We were psyched about unemployment dropping to about 3.8%. It's since risen slightly to about 4%. Now, there's an asterisk there. And this is, that, this is an asterisk that I wanted to go in a little bit of detail on. This is one of the statistical observations that we have. So yes, unemployment that we disclose, this U number, <clears throat> U3, uh, that we disclose that's representative of the total number of people who are in the labor force looking for jobs divided by the size of the labor force. Uh, why would this number change or why would this number you know, you know, go up when we have such a robust jobs market? So there's also a lot of uh, statistical finagling that happens behind the scenes, and and you know to get a sense of this, and and it's not, you know, it's it's not with the intention of manipulating the data. It's with the intention of making the data more accurate. 0.3 percent uh, of uh, the unemployment rate um, of this unemployment rate rise. So unemployment was 3.8 percent last uh, month. It's 4 percent now, uh, an increase of 0.2 percent. Uh, but 0.3% growth was added due to a statistical adjustment based upon them revising their population model. So, uh, so you could look at it and say, well, it's really 3.7. It's not really 3.7. It's just the nature of, it's not a bad number compared to where it was before. It was just statistically adjusted upwards based on new information that went in the background data that collected these models. So Scott points out a really good question. With these upward revisions, may one start to feel better about the jobs market now? That's a good question, Scott. And feeling for certainly, certainly, certainly the first step into making your own reality is feeling the reality is better. So I would have to say though, in, in overall though, what this does is affirm that the job market has strengths that, uh, uh, um, that are genuinely impressive. And I'm going to divide that in the next few slides, Scott. I'll show you what those strengths look like, where they are and where they're focused. But also we have causes for concern. Um, and, and the biggest cause for concern, perhaps, is that the amount of open jobs, uh, we now have uh, the greatest ratio of actual uh, jobs that are open versus the jobs that are being filled uh, that we've ever had. Uh, there's twice as many jobs that are job openings to, to job uh, people who are looking for jobs. And, um, and what this means is, is there's a mismatch between uh, what the labor force has available and what they're willing to do and what the economy needs. So in aggregate, when this sort of thing happens, uh, it makes it tougher for the economy to recover um, because we're not filling people in the places we need to fill them uh, that help support all the other jobs as well. And so Albert points out, what are the quality of these jobs too? That's a very good question. And certainly, the, the, and this is the key here, and on the right side, you see sort of the industries that were hit hardest by the pandemic spike. And this is really interesting. So, so this is just the employment change between December and uh, 2021 and January, 2022. The biggest chunk is in leisure and hospitality. Remember leisure and hospitality, the, the sector that was singularly hardest hit during the middle of the pandemic last year, it is also the source of our greatest growth rate. Right? When you lose a lot of jobs, you also typically gain them back fastest. Uh, but in this case, these jobs, when you ask about quality, these are often um, uh, in response to higher wages. People are filling some of these service sector jobs, but the amount of openings are outstrip uh, the amount of uh, people who are actually being hired. And that's very interesting. We also have some other sectors on this. So Albert, to your point on quality, uh, one, one really rosy spot in this particular um, uh, jobs report is within our business services sector. And so business services reflect a broad range of occupations dealing from accountants and all those other, I mean, all, well, that's really financial services, but really uh, dealing with uh, uh, any uh, business that could be uh, grouped together within the concept uh, broadly of, of a business service. They were up about 86,000. A lot of these jobs can be very high paying. 
Then we have retail trade jobs. Those are typically lower paying jobs at 61K. And again, an extra 54K in transportation and warehousing. This is robust because it's a big, it's a big deal in the Bay Area and uh, uh, transportation and warehousing because um, of the ports and, it's, it's, and, and the importance of trade to the uh, Bay Area economy. So I expect that when the January numbers for the Bay Area come out, we're gonna see a, a continued jump in transportation and warehousing employment as well. Because um, typically it's been tracking really well, uh, uh, you know, um, and I'll get some better data on that for next time as well. So, so quality is mixed. We're still seeing those lower uh, paying jobs get, but the wages are coming up to a level where people are saying, you know, this is at a level where I can do, uh, where I can actually get back into this. The thing with jobs is, is there is a wage, a clearance wage, we would say, uh, uh, for almost any type of job or employment, depending on the workforce that you have. So any situation, think of all the jobs you've ever had that have led you up to being in front of this audience in, in, in Albert's list right now. And I'm thinking of mine, I was a cashier or a barista, or I had all these other, I had all the other Riley jobs and I had all these other things that were, that were not very particularly high paying. But uh, so what level would I go back to be a cashier again? Well, obviously if I was unemployed, I would, I would, I would take it. But uh, 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 there's, a, there's a level at which we individually would work at these jobs. And the hard part is, is when you, you deal with sort of a mass labor uh, um, transformation, which is what happened in the last year and a half, we have a situation where companies and businesses are now uh, have a dearth of workers. They were laid off. Nobody was sitting by the phone going, please hire me back for my dishwasher job. They went on to do other things, right? Because that's what happens. People leave, they go on to do other things. And so they've had a hard time filling this. And so combine that with uh, teenage employment dropping uh, uh, very steadily over the last 30 or 40 years. A lot of reasons for that. Uh, um, and they're variable. Uh, some, we argue, you know, we look at the questions of, oh, you know, you know, you know, the, there's, there's, um, you know, we, we can divide it on demographically, we can divide it based on income, we can divide it based on a number of different levels, but teenagers are working in less numbers than they were before. And, um, and consequently, uh, uh, you know, we're also looking at other labor labor pressures that existed prior to the pandemic. So the, the fact that Legion Hospitality is, is, has the most jobs is not surprising, but they're not high, high quality jobs, but they are. Um, also, this sector has the highest wage growth of any of our sectors. They've experienced almost 15% year on year uh, wage growth in the last year, which is an incredibly high number for a year. In aggregate, we saw at the end of this year, we had a 0.7% increase in hourly wages in the last month. 0.7% is huge. Overall, over the last year, that's about 5.7%. That's a very big number. Again, somewhat below inflation, but it does show that wages in some respects are attempting to keep up with the market. Now, the real thing for me in this report that was very, very exciting, and I'm gonna say it's exciting right now, but then I'm gonna dial it back a bit because it's very uneven, is the increase in labor force participation. As you know, I have bemoaned this for the last like 10 months I've looked at this and said, we've basically been stuck at the 61.6 to 61.9% level uh, for, for, for a very long time. Um, and again, the labor force participation is the amount of people of working age who have a job are in the labor force and um, uh, you know, looking for a job, employed, et cetera, et cetera. And um, it reached its peak actually uh, uh, about 20 years ago, uh, about 67%. Um, uh, right around the year 2000. Um, and each time we have a recession, it's never really recovered. So uh, we can have a stable labor force uh, uh, level, uh, like right before the 2008 financial crisis, and then it drops, and then it never really comes back to where it was before, um, even as it builds and even as we enter an economic recovery. So, um, and there's a reason for this puzzle. We saw an increase in labor force that was drastically huge between the 70s, 80s, and 90s as women entered the workforce in mass. And consequently, um, we reached sort of this maximum labor force in, 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 in the year 2000. And then since then, it's, it's gone back a bit. And people have come up with different theories about why this might be. You know, is it because more people are being educated? Are we being uh, uh, different about the way we do this? Are we retiring at different times? And, and there are all these other issues that, that tie into this. Is it just based on demographic concerns where we have just a huge working age population of boomers, and then we're going to gradually lose some of that due, due to retirement? It's a combination of probably all of those things, but the fact it jumped from 61.9 to 62.2 in a high uh, uh, virus related environment is very, very interesting because it shows that people, and actually this is slightly higher than I even projected. I was concerned we'd be stuck below 62 for a while. Um, it shows that there are still, uh, there's still gas in the tank. 
for people to come back and, and enter the workforce again. And my guess is much of this is in response to higher wages and also, but here's the thing, we looked at how uh, how this is divided and actually going, I'll go to, I won't give it away now. We'll talk, we'll talk about it in a few minutes. <clears throat> But industries that were hardest hit, the, the areas that we didn't see job growth, mining and logging and construction. And this makes sense. Construction, we have, eh, it's December, it's winter across much, uh, it's winter across the country, construction kind of slows. Mining it, it, it builds and, and ebbs and flows with, and logging ebbs and flows with commodity prices and commodity markets. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and financial activities have been low, manufacturing uh, only about 13,000 aggregate jobs made. But the good news is, is we've seen job growth almost in every other sector. And because we had such a high impact of, of coronavirus in the last month, and because that correlation between the jobs report numbers and uh, uh, the um, infection figures is so great, it was anticipated that this, this, this month would be low. And, and the good news is it was not. And let's take a look a little bit about some of these revisions. <clears throat> oh, this is really good. Oh, yes. You're answering this question right now. What various roles, Scott, I love, I always love Scott questions. What various roles have barriers to travel and migration across the country to work on mass labor transformation the last one and a half years that you mentioned earlier? I'm going to go into this and I actually have a little section here and I'll show you that about uh, uh, where we might be missing workers. And, and I think um, I'll give you a sense of this. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll jump down to this right now to help answer some of Scott's questions before we go back into this as well. And so you saw this, this quit rate graph in November 2021. It looks basically the same in, in December and January. But this is really interesting. And this is a figure uh, from EconoFact uh, looking at this value. And um, when we look at, at certain things around values and we look at, say, uh, um, reasons that we've seen labor force transformations in certain ways and, and why labor forces move. If you look up labor shortages prior to the 2020 uh, pandemic, um, you do find them and you find them in the same sectors we see them now. Uh, so um, and I'm thinking back to an article that Vox came out with in 2019 that looked at labor shortages within um, the, the, the restaurant industry. And this is an interesting discussion. So we've had um, and, and, and in short, there's a lot of reasons for this, but we can go one by one by them. Uh, one thing that's often overlooked is sort of our, our, our foreign born population, which represents a very sizable impact and a very positive impact to the US economy. So um, agnostic to your question, whatever your political preferences might be as a group, um, the, uh, the research in economics and finance is very strong regarding the economic benefits of immigration in general. Um, and not only does it boost working age populations, but it also boosts uh, the labor force in a lot of type of jobs and sectors that don't particularly pay very well, um, and jobs that they often find it very difficult to fill with American workers. Also, it happens at both levels. So you have low paying workers and also high paying workers across the technology industry and other places. Um, one of the great joys I have as being a finance professor is I am uh, the only American born uh, member of my finance department. And that is a great, uh, and I love it. I think it's fantastic um, because of the level of, 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 of competition in these industries. And <clears throat> when we think about working age foreign born populations, since 2019, uh, we've had a rough immigration shortfall of about 2 million people. Uh, 2 million people goes a long way into addressing a lot of our specific labor shortage concerns. And a lot of this is, it's a mixture of immigration policy, it's a mixture of um, um, our perception and our, our, of, of being a place to immigrate to, um, as well as the complexities and difficulty it is to get there. I can't tell you uh, how many times now I've had students graduate um, looking for permanent um, uh, residency in the United States and then and then not winning the the, the lottery uh, on the immigration side and they're they're brilliant and capable and uh, it breaks my heart every single time uh, uh, we can't do that because that's a lost that that economic contribution is lost for a long time forever uh, in the United States and so and so I think we don't talk enough about this because I think there's a lot of other discussions that people go into oh people don't want to work people don't do this well there's a lot of other things happening here and and the other thing as well is it's a matter of <clears throat> you know uh, it takes a long time to adjust to labor market conditions that are different so whereas in one regime you can maintain and pay workers and have an expectation of paying workers a certain amount you may or may not have the ability as a company to increase uh, that wage in response to, to different demands. And so let's do an example. Like it's very difficult in many governments, for instance, 
uh, to increase their wages to at market rates uh, uh, without legislation, without um, a sort of a great deal of red tape internally to make sure that happens. Obviously, when, when you're hired in, sometimes some companies maintain rigorous structures involving pay and certain numbers of years of service. And even though these have been hard fought and negotiated in inflationary times, when the expectation is for higher wage growth, it's hard to meet those demands within those constraints. Firms that have been able to take advantage of this have been able to award people with additional pay. And I think right now you have to Scott's question. Um, the story is, is that we have barriers to travel and migration. Migration is the barrier that affects a lot of uh, aspects of, of how we view our economies. And even if we look at it this way, and migration is an imperfect thing. So even if we had a perfect uh, open market, and a good example is Europe, for instance, um, we know that if we're, if we're putting on our just economist hats, in looking at the European, uh, uh, you know, the European Union, or even before then, sort of the common uh, economic area, um, you know, it's obviously advantageous from a cost situation. If somebody from Germany were to start a factory or move to Greece, or or to have a free movement of labor in such a way that 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 you know, uh, you know. <clears throat> Poorer areas became wealthier. Wealthier areas became, uh, uh, you know, uh, more diverse in their inhabitants and their, in their different capacities. And in reality, there are frictions that take place, right? Nobody. It takes a lot for somebody to say, "I'm going to pick up and leave where I come from to come to a different place," and then contribute economically to that area. And at the same time, it's also really, really challenging <clears throat> linguistically. It's challenging for uh, uh, culturally. It's challenging across a number of vectors. And so migration really has never been, labor always exists as a hype. We always put it as a variable in our models, but it's not something that can be you know, effectively addressed without adding a whole bunch of those and identifying those barriers and making that happen. And on the other hand, if you think about the other sense, so companies' abilities to respond to wage growth have been varied. Uh, uh, market demand has changed. You know, a lot of people have asked, and so my students were asking in, in the previous year, my MBA students, they say, well, you know, we had a, a, a class discussion on minimum wage and people always talk about, you know, there's a lot of discussion about minimum wage and how it affects the labor market. Like we looked at aggregate papers, we looked at over a hundred different papers uh, that have been published in the last 25 years covering this topic. And if we did, this is sort of, I could just, you know, look at a meta-analysis or something, but I was like, no, we're going to, let's, let's source the models. And everyone was so tired of minimum wage after that. But we looked at it and, and essentially, you know, if we go down to minimum wage, one of the interesting aspects is, is as wages increase uh, in a sector, as minimum wage increases, it doesn't put a lot of workers out of work, but it does put the area that's most, if people do lose jobs, they lose the people that lose jobs are often teenagers. Uh, if a company has a choice to pick an, uh, a worker who without a lot of experience, uh, for fifteen dollars an hour, or uh, an older worker for fifteen dollars an hour, they pick the older worker, and um, and 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 so we see. Uh, but then again, you could argue, based on what I just said, is that is that an endogeneity problem involving, you know? And I'd have to look at the uh, looking at the gradual decline of teenage labor. Is that caused just because teenagers don't want to work, and 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 because they have all these other commitments to try to get them into college? Anyway, all these other things are possible. So, long story short, it's a mixed mis mixed message on that. But when we talk about this, we end up with one crucial fact, and that it takes a very long time uh, to change. It's steering a battleship in the economic markets to try to make and hire enough people to fit where there are actual needs. So if we said to you, we, we, we're missing 4 million dishwashers, how would you obtain 4 million dishwashers? You don't really have a choice to do this. The incentives don't exist for education of dishwashers and maintaining that in that way. And the wages don't make it attractive for a lot of people in other sectors to go into washing dishes. And so then what becomes the labor force question and how do you address it from a policy standpoint? And then the question becomes, well, if you're a company, can I automate this or do it with less? And what we've seen is that the initial response is at least, well, can our existing workers work more? <laughs> and then consequently, what we've, what we've seen is this increase in the hourly wage over the last, um, uh, or the hours worked, I should say, this year. It actually dipped a little bit, but I'll explain why uh, 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 this month. Uh, but uh, uh, workers were trying, where workers were doing more uh, uh, for their employees in general. So a lot of things, Scott, that's a great question. So from rags to revise, look at these revisions. So to give you a sense of this, the numbers that are before the revisions are the striped numbers. The numbers that we have, the final numbers, January was just released, it hasn't been revised, it will be revised. I don't know in which direction, I'm hoping that it is positive at least. 
Notice that at least for the last one, two, three, six months, the revisions have been positive. The overall uh, job market has been better than we thought it was. But however, in last summer, uh, they were all revised down, and that was the source of this. So right now, the, this is the this is the, the 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 engine that keeps on chugging is our job our, our job engine, and anywhere where we're talking about above three hundred thousand, above four hundred thousand jobs a month is still uh, uh, demonstrating economic recovery. So let's talk about this as well. What happened in the last month? So. The Omicron spike led to unprecedented levels of workers who were out sick. And to give you a sense of this, how unprecedented that was, and I'm gonna zoom in for the cheap seats here. You know, uh, let me take my, my joblet here for a second. Oh, excuse me. So uh, CDC caseload numbers and, and uh, number of workers absent due to own illness. We are the red number. <laughs> it's very interesting, April to January, 2022. How many people were out of work uh, uh, based on sickness in the last month? An incredible, incredible number. The hard way to herd immunity, but we're almost there, hopefully, I hope, eventually. Um, and the other thing to think about this labor force market as well, and, and based on stats questions, is it is uneven. And so we have, uh, we have increased our participation rate by the biggest jump we've seen in quite a while. However, if we look at this, and we look at our labor force back since February 2020, uh, the men have recovered in this labor force. We have more, more men are employed right now than they were back in February of 2020. That is not the case with women. And so this leads to suggestions, why would women leave the job market or not be part of the job market for a lot of very good reasons. Number one and two um, cited most often, unavailability of childcare. Um, it falls disproportionately on women unavailability of elder care, um, the ability in, in household responsibilities. There's a lot of this that's happening that makes it more challenging in the job market right now for women. And one of the big challenges we have in labor force is not just a shortage in leisure and hospitality, but it's a, sh a true shortage in childcare facilities. Childcare closures were numerous. Childcare workers don't get paid a lot. Their work is hard. And as a parent, you know it is terrible. Uh, and consequently, uh, the incentive um, for workers in this industry to work in this way just aren't there. And, uh, and consequently, it's disproportionately hitting a sector of the population heaviest, and that's parents. So until this fixes, and I don't know, this will continue to be a drag on the economy. Anytime we see, where we see insufficient workers, that caps our growth, it caps our recovery. And so it limits our ability to recover in a meaningful way, and it puts the brakes on, on things or where we could potentially go faster. And uh, the other thing I want to think about, and this is the thing I mentioned earlier, this is, uh, if we take the two numbers and we look at the job openings and, and the amount of unemployed workers, we now have double, double the openings per unemployed worker, two jobs for each unemployed worker. But again, to your point, and to the points of the questions here, they're not concentrated in a single sector. They're not, uh, uh, I mean, they're not concentrated in all the sectors, I should say. Uh, they're concentrated heavily in the areas that need jobs most, uh, leisure and hospitality, um, in, uh, you know, uh, service sector industries that are often low paying. At higher levels, you get more competitive. The case is not the case. If you look at the growth in the financial services industry, it hasn't been great. Um, it's been okay, and they've done well enough, uh, but it's not, you know, it's not insanity by any means. And so consequently, you have this variation in here. Uh, and, uh, and this is interesting because we're not, and this actually came, and I give Joe Cardillo credit for this, for sending me this uh, article uh, to this link. He wanted it. He had a good idea to talk about this a bit. The mismatch uh, that exists, you know, to our point before, how can you incentivize people to have this way? Uh, obviously, if given a long enough string of, of time, and the hard part is, is the other ingredient to any labor force transformation is time. So, uh, you know, and not, I'm not Malthusian, I'm not, you know, a, a follower, I don't believe that technological advancement results in, in aggregate losses for humanity. I think the data has shown quite the opposite, but it does incentive, it does create an incentive for a, a fundamental change in, in labor force. If we do not meet this with short term changes to our immigration policy, short term changes to our um, our, our, our sort of economic policy or, or encourage the increased wages in these sectors. And I don't know how that would be precisely. I'm not advocating for that as a policy initiative. But uh, 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 this means that 
in the long run, this does incentivize workers to change the way they do this business. And, and whether that means automation, like you've seen in supermarkets or even in some restaurants where automated ordering or automated uh, checkouts have become the norm, whether you like the lines or not like the lines, um, you know, it's, it's a question that, um, that really is, is fundamentally economic to a lot of these organizations. Uh, and a lot of uh, companies who have who had withheld investment on those sort of technologies are now giving them a second glance because they're looking ahead and saying, you know, maybe, maybe this is actually something that will uh, be sort of a permanent uh, loss in our economy. So maybe how can we replace this job with something that actually does the same thing? <sighs> and that's a very good question. And we don't have all the technological answers to that, but <laughs> my goal, it'll happen first in Silicon Valley. So Bay Area unemployment, let's drop down to the Bay Area for a minute here and let's talk a little bit about how the Bay Area did. Remember that the Bay Area lags a month. I don't have January data yet, but we have December preliminary numbers. Good news is labor force was up. Unemployment rate dropped to three and a half percent. One of our strongest metropolitan areas across the country uh, uh, for unemployment rates, relatively speaking. Um, and it's very interesting. So you had six and a half thousand jobs again, capping off another 8,000 jobs in trade. If you look at it this way, you're generating in the Bay Area, a sizable percentage of the trade and transportation growth that we're seeing across the country. So the fact that you're continually adding jobs in these sectors is a good sign also for our supply chains. So CPI, uh, uh, two CPI measures, our urban CPI, looking at a mixture of urban consumers up about 4.2%, our more generalized CPI up about 5.5%. Now, again, these numbers are a little bit lower than national numbers. And part of that is due because of that proportion that comes from housing. Housing growth, because it's already expensive in the Bay Area, grew by a smaller percentage. And consequently, that falls through in this, these numbers. So what I'm looking for ahead of time is, I think, greater growth on leisure and hospitality. Right now, uh, uh, leisure and hospitality is up 38% year on year from where they were last year. But they still have tens of thousands of jobs in the Bay Area that haven't been met. And so you're going to see continued pressure upward in this direction. I suspect it will have a rosy, uh, like the country's leisure and hospitality numbers are rosy. I think they'll be uh, uh, rosier uh, when the January numbers come out that we discussed in February. Uh, so we have a lot of interesting things going on here. But overall, it's good. The ship is steady. This looks like a recovering and fairly healthy metropolitan area. And the amount of people who are unemployed. Uh, within the labor force dropped to just 88,000 of about a 2.5 million uh, uh, size labor force uh, in the San Francisco, Oakland, Hayward uh, vicinity. This means uh, uh, that these, these are the lowest numbers that we've seen uh, in quite some time. And they net seven and a half thousand uh, jobs. Uh, there are seven and a half thousand fewer people unemployed this month than there were last month in the Bay Area. Uh, and heavy it went into those sectors. One very disappointing area is government for the reasons I think we described before. Government employment is down even from where we look at it last year by about 1%. Um, that, that margin has been um, improving a little bit, uh, but it is hard for governments again, in particular to reach increases in wages and, make, and, 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 and meet the affordability criteria within a very expensive region. Okay, so before we get into our outlook, any questions about this? I just like, <laughs> I wheeled a bunch of numbers at you. Everybody signed off. Oh dear. <laughs> okay, cool. Can you put here? Yay! Albert's, Albert has to be here. Good. <laughs> He's good. Albert, Albert, Albert left. It's no longer Albert's list. It defaults. There's a hierarchy. There's a <laughs> becomes like a you know sort of like the the Queen of England. There's like a you know eventually you're the 85th in line to the throne. I mean one of those things. Uh, so uh, let's go into the outlook as well. Thanks, Albert. Uh, so um, let's talk about uh, a little bit of our outlook so far. And, and I'm kind of kind of redo this. I gave an outlook presentation for our local. Um, we have a regional group of estate planners and I gave uh, uh, their talk at the annual uh, forecast dinner there um, about what my forecast was. So I borrowed a lot of my own numbers. We're gonna stick to macro numbers, look at a few other data uh, that my dear colleague, uh, Sunny Gokhale also worked with me on. Uh, so, so I'll show you a little bit of what we got. We'll do a quick survey of this and then talk where it could go from here. And so let's talk about this. So the first thing is let's talk about inflation. Is inflation gonna get better? Is it long-term or is it short-term? The answer to both of those questions is yes, 
<laughs> so here's what we got. Uh, in short, we need, <laughs> we were hoping for, and I love this article from the, I love, I'm going to go to the right first. You know, inflation is big, which is what the article, which is what the chart on the left shows. The chart on the right, looking at uh, the Financial Times loves watching the container ships in LA and Long Beach. It is a huge port, one of our largest ports in the country. Um, and Right now, if you look at and gauge the number of container ships that are queued and are waiting for a berth in port, after some relief, we hoped in October they had peaked, we actually now have the highest number of ships on record uh, that are waiting to dock and be unloaded uh, at the port of Los Angeles. And so this is a really challenging time. So the question is, is why has it gotten worse? And there's actually a few things about this. So one of the, I was, I was digging deep in a shipping dynamics in the last you know, a uh, month and if anything, econ econ you know, economists are often full of ship, uh, but uh, ships in general, ships, ships, uh, ships in general are, are always fascinating to us because they're the engine of production, of movement and of time. And so uh, it's how goods get transported, supply chains are global. Consequently, uh, any issue with one of those aspects in the supply chain that doesn't work out or any, um, any failure of a particular unit within a supply chain um, can, can create uh, sort of devastating delays um, as you go about doing this. And it becomes very, very hard to, to, to sort of write, write the vote, so to speak. Uh, and use other maritime maritime uh, analogies. Uh, so if we look at this in a different way, um, the Chinese economy has been uh, having, and it, despite posting 8.1% GDP growth, I believe in the last year, uh, uh, they've been having some challenges. Ironically, the fact that because we're all interconnected economically, the fact that the Chinese economy has had some challenges and reduced their demand, we've seen some, uh, uh, their real estate market in particular, having been hit by a couple of, 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 of scandalously high bad news um, um, areas. Um, Chinese demand or slackening Chinese demand is decreasing uh, the, de the incentives to make improvements along the supply chain to either make more ships, ports, or infrastructure. Meanwhile, in the United States, we have labor shortages to actually get people to be there and, the, and, and un, you know, unload these ships within a certain amount of time. And consequently, um, what this means is, is the supply chain shortages I had hoped would have been resolved by now. And I'm pretty sure I said that in a previous meeting. I'm like, by January, we should be okay. <laughs> oh, wrong, wrong, and wrong. Uh, it's still pretty bad. It's still the same reason, you, you know, it's still challenging um, across the world. And so what has to happen on this level is, is already happening. The process of looking at alternative suppliers, looking at alternative areas, and also rebuilding our transportation infrastructure in different ways. All of that takes time. I do still believe this will, will turn the corner on this. Why do we see inflation growth in the first point? Production difficulty, shortages of semiconductor chips, right? Greater demand for commodities like lumber. Lumber prices are still really high when labor and capital are used intensively. And this is the bottom line. When we use people and money, our investment money intensively, the cost of these products rise. The cost of people rise. And this creates an incentive for inflation. Wage growth powers long-term inflation. So wage growth is good because it's helping people get more money, but it also means that companies can get away with charging more. Now, the long-term question, and that should be a question mark here, not just long-term. What an insightful bullet point you're looking at, Riley. I'm so glad you took the time to write down two words. Uh, long-term. Long-term will be decided by a couple of macroeconomic factors, and my case for much of this not being long-term is still there. It is likely that the Federal Reserve will increase rates this year. The Federal Reserve sets one, one rate, right? That's the discount rate as we know it in popular parlance, but it reflects the discount rate is nothing more than um, overnight lending to large banks, basically. And uh, uh, when the Fed raises this rate, it raises the cost of borrowing across aspects of the economy. And when borrowing costs rise, it makes it puts a cap on economic activity. Caps on economic activity mean there's less money that are, is going to be floating around for investment, less money flowing into people's pockets. It can help control inflation. Likewise, when the Fed wants to stimulate the 
economy, they lower rates, they want to flood the market with money, so we do stuff with it. And so the Fed's good, the Fed, there's actually four to five, and actually five most recently, rate hikes priced into the market. Each rate hike is about a quarter percent increase. Right now, people are projecting at the end of the year that, uh, uh, that those short-term bonds will approach about 1.4% of interest. Now, that's very, very high relative to where we've been before. But uh, what this means is this will put pressure <laughs> on um, inflation to go down. But it also means it'll put pressure <clears throat> And our short-term growth, our short-term inflation growth will be curbed a little bit. We still have a couple of rough months out there. Gas uh, fuel prices have gone up still. The uncertainty in the Russia-Ukraine um, uh, geopolitical realm uh, has caused uh, uh, gas prices to continue to go up, oil prices to rise. This will be seen in higher inflation in the next month or two. But as we get through this period, we will evolve into a situation that will be, it'll start looking more like a regular sort of inflation, but it will likely be elevated for the rest of the year. Uh, rising labor costs uh, in response to job shortages resulted in wage growth, right? This also fuels long-term inflation, but it also solves some of those job issues. Inflation makes it difficult for consumers and firms to plan for savings and investment. It also means there's wide disparities in expectations of economic growth going forward. We talked a little bit about the next slide already. That was the working age foreign born population. And now I'm going to do something. This is a really obscure pun. Any, any fans of Richard III in the audience? No, this is fine. He was a... Ah, oh, that's terrible. Anyway, thus far into the houses of the land. It should be something else. Anyway, let's talk about real estate prices. So right now, mortgage rates very close, uh, bottomed out last year, uh, very close to being at the bottom rate. When we raise rates overall, those rates will come up. It is likely mortgage rates will go up more than three, three and a half, above 3.6%, approaching 4% on average and potentially higher as those rates come up. However, how do you think house prices will do this year? So let's ask the expert. So Goldman Sachs expects a 12% return in house prices in 2022. Zillow, 11%. Uh, the Mortgage Banker Association, who share my, uh, uh, you know, mortgage bankers, we, they're the most nihilistic of our banking community, uh, suggest that house prices might go down 2.5%. I'm in the middle a little bit. I expect moderate growth, but very low. I don't expect 12% growth this year. I expect something. If you ask me to be specific, Riley, so we can call you out on how wrong you are at the end of the year, my number is going to be about 4.5%. That's where I'm projecting us to come in. Very close to the middle of this, but my logic is I still think there's a lot of gas for continued growth, and there isn't a lot of things stopping real estate growth, and the numbers are still pretty low, and anyone who's selling their house now has an expectation of a higher rate, but you're also going to have different values in this as well. I think for the Bay Area, we've already kind of turned that corner a little bit on those prices, and you've seen, will those declines in prices continue? Probably, and the good news is, is this will result if we dive down into the Bay Area more specifically, um, I do expect that growth will be low um, and lower than continue or, uh, uh, not only will the national growth rate be lower than it was before, but San Francisco will remain below uh, the national growth rate um, so far. So only thing that would change that is if mortgage rates went down even further, and that seems unlikely. As you increase mortgage rates, the size of a house you can get <laughs> shrinks dramatically. And so consequently, this in its natural, uh, uh, in its natural ebb and flow, um, it's likely that uh, just by default of raising, just by a result of higher rates, um, you'll end up with um, you'll end up with, with with lower growth. So I'm still looking in the four four and a half percent range. It's quite possible it will drop this year. The mortgage bankers might have it right. I think the mortgage bankers are probably more right than Goldman Sachs right now. But that's like these are people who literally get paid for this business, and they're arguing and they're <laughs> making a do. At least everyone is always over optimistic. All these biases that we have that support this, and they're still fighting through them and saying it will drop. So anyway, let's talk a little bit about markets. So modest rates on markets so far. This is the, the moral of this is very smart people have very different opinions about things. So first of all, let's look at something like oil as a commodity, right? So oil as a commodity, is it going to be uh, an, an economy that from an investment perspective, it gets more expensive, which means that you should invest in oil. And I'm not suggesting that literally, please don't take, you just fill up your, you know, you know, you've got this is condo in, in, you know, in, in Redwood City or something, and it's just full of oil barrels. Don't that probably violate zoning. I'm thinking on the other hand that you need to create something. The question is, as an investment commodity, is it worthwhile to invest in, in oil going up in value? And the challenging part on this is that 
Morgan Stanley says it is one of the best things you can invest in this year because it's going to be more expensive. LPL says no, <laughs> it's not going to be good. JP Morgan, the, uh, you know, the, uh, what's it called? The evil twin sibling of Morgan Stanley. Uh, uh, you know, they're also very positive on oil. Um, BlackRock Fidelity, all commodities generally positive. And this is interesting. So traditionally, it is, so when you think about commodities, why do we look at commodities as investment and what do they mean? In the last year and a half, we've looked at different commodities in different ways. Lumber, of course, a commodity that is needed to save power our construction industry and help build out homes. Um, and, the, and to a side note on this real estate, by the way, that reminds me, uh, one of the things we look at are our housing starts and housing is responding to higher prices across the country. They are being developed, but they're also being crippled by supply chain issues. And the level of response isn't what we expect given the size of our uh, and growth of our, of, our, of our house price values. And so consequently what happens is then, um, you know, uh, we don't have enough we don't have enough housing stock to meet demand. We can't build fast enough, consequently. And in uh, uh, this allows prices to continue to rise. And I suspect eventually lumber prices coming down further, this will help contribute to greater growth in housing where it's needed or allowed and consequently help also contribute to a fall in prices in the long run. Not a fall, but a drop in growth. I'm not gonna commit to fall yet. Um, or, uh, or even autumn. <laughs> but uh, one thing here, is uh, uh, across the board, commodities have done well in various times and various economies. Real, if you buy into sort of uh, one portfolio finance argument is looking at how cycles ebb and flow with certain markets. We know, for instance, traditionally people invested in gold during recessionary periods, right? And, uh, you know, I was thinking back, oh, that's a good story. I don't know if you tell that. But anyway, gold, um, this was back in 2000, like right during the financial crisis in 2008. And I was working as a banker in Boston and my grandmother uh, lived in Castro Valley. And uh, she calls me up one day and because we were actually didn't call me up. Well, actually I, I flew out there uh, at that time just to like visit her and uh, in Castro Valley. And uh, I was, uh, I visited my grandmother and, uh, uh, and she, you know, said to me, she goes, you know, somebody called me and, and, you know, I, you know, I, I didn't know what to say. He said he had a great investment for me to buy into and it was six gold coins. And I go, okay, you know, grandma, that's, that sounds interesting. You didn't pay too much for them. I hope I said, and she goes, no, they're each an ounce each but I paid my entire retirement savings for them, which at that time, so the net of all of her pensions and of that of my grandfather, who was a uh, retired um, uh, Marine Corps uh, uh, officer, um, he, uh, uh, you added that up in total, she had about $50,000 and uh, she spent it all on six gold coins. Now, if you do the math on that and the price of gold, that is six ounces of gold bullion approximately. That's what it's worth. It doesn't matter what's stamped on it, if it's magical or it's a unicorn or anything else. What you're buying is six ounces of gold. The price of six ounces of gold at that time was about seven, eight thousand dollars more or less. And, 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 and he had just sold her this on the promise that the investment would grow because it was a recession to $50,000. And so then, you know, that's not only is that horrifyingly unethical, but uh, uh, it shows how people can feed off of the speculation of expectation that asset prices will rise. And she goes, I have no, did I make a mistake? I'm like, that's you, I'm like, I was, I was, I was really, I was not mad at her. I was mad at this, 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 I mean, she was 90 years old. I mean, at the time, uh, and, and this guy was, um, uh, uh, this guy who sold her this was out of Texas. And so I called him and I'm like, what did you do? Why are you selling this to, to an old woman? And I made, I may have elaborated or possibly been slightly dishonest in my representation of myself. I was like, oh, you know, I'm a, you know, I work at a bank and I'm, you know, very, very important. I'm very important. And what happened was, is they ended up um, refunding her after I quasi threatened, you know, legal action uh, preying on the elderly. I don't know what I could have really done from a legal perspective, but they refunded her and that was great. And we never talked about it again. I'm like, okay, just don't do this. And then what happened was because it was a recession, gold price approached, gold prices approached $2,000 an ounce. And then she calls me and she's like, they're $2,000 an ounce. And I'm like, you paid like the equivalent of $8,000 an ounce for these coins. You're still better off not investing in them. But gold is somewhat changing in this respect. Uh, when you think about gold as a commodity, uh, people are also going to other asset classes, cryptocurrency, other things. And consequently, you know, this relationship holds, but it's not precise. 
Um, precious metals, industrial metals, agricultural commodities, a lot of those things depend heavily on supply and demand, the availability of harvests. They're often really hard to predict. And so while most of them suggest that commodities will do well, not all of them are going to do well. Um, consecutively, if we look at a few things, precious metals appears twice, mainly because of Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, both arguing that precious metals in particular will not do well. And again, that's optimistic because if you consider things like gold, uh, and you expect gold will go up in a recessionary environment, it does imply that this year will continue to be good. This year will be good, but it won't be great. S&P 500, think about the uh, year-end price of the stock market. So a bunch of predictions across the board. Again, the 86-year average is about 10 to 11%, depending on if you use an arithmetic or geometric average uh, for the S&P 500 growth rate. So what they're saying is a stock market that will return a little bit below the average value. A couple um, banks, Bank of America and Morgan Stanley, are coming in a little bit low. I think we're up for a volatile year. I think we're up for a potential year that could result in some challenges for equities. And, and you know, in my personal opinion, and not giving personal advice, I'm being a little bit more cautious um, in my approach to the S&P 500. Uh, this is not shared. I do have a colleague uh, in the industry who's very robust um, on, um, on the S&P 500 performance. Profits have been quite good. And uh, what we say is a stock price is nothing more than one big present value of all the money, the profits, the company that is gonna make either free cash flow or dividends. So we expect if profits can continue to rise and prices can grow, this can continue to power the stock market higher. So I would not be surprised. I think these are right on par to where they should be positive numbers, but also single digits. Okay, so let's bring down, let's break it down further. So let's think about what we got. So real GDP growth, that's GDP. That's not our fake GDP, but it's our real GDP. GDP minus inflation. So what are we actually growing by? So because we have such high inflation rates, and I've, I've downgraded my estimate on this, I was estimating about 4.5% this year. I have since downgraded that to 3% based on persistence of inflation. The Fed is likely going to raise rates about four to five times. Inflation is going to be highest right now, and it should hopefully fall to around 3% uh, at year end. That's still my hope. That's my hope. Real disposable income may drop slightly in 2022 because of this. If we take it, if we take wages, right, the wage growth we've seen, which is good, but net it from inflation, I wouldn't be surprised if that number is slightly negative, perhaps negative 1%. Not good news. But unemployment rate will probably be still be around 4%. We'll go up and down a little bit in that category. Labor shortages will ease, but slowly. And real estate growth will slow drastically as rates rise. You heard my results on this. But let's think about what could happen, right? So what's the other side of our finance coin? Higher wage growth could contribute to longer lasting inflation for a while. That is true. Lumber prices surged in late 2020. Uh, steel remains elevated. Uh, uh, input costs, all these input costs make construction more expensive. And trade policy, which should be helping our country, is actually unnaturally restrictive right now. And, and now I say this, this is the sector in, in economics and finance where like you could make this better if you just, you know, loosen some of the tariffs and trade restrictions that make things more expensive and make it harder for companies to source things from different places. And so consequently, the hard part is, is this is going to trade policy, unless there's a bill coming that I don't know, it'll likely remain relatively restrictive, which will inhibit some of our ability to respond to these supply chain issues. Rate hikes increase borrowing costs. This slows economic growth. Labor shortages that are exacerbated by the pandemic are probably going to continue. And they're going to continue and we'll be talking about them. And I actually think we'll be talking about service sector labor shortages in five years. But quickly rising wages in some sectors and any level where we can get more Im immigrants and other people to approach and consider living and working in the country would, would help resolve this. Supply chains are improving and easing demand will likely improve the backlogs. But weakness in China are actually, and one of the reasons is, is in flagging demand are, are reducing shipping costs, which in turn reduce an incentive to improve the transportation network. And the big thing is beware of flattening yield curve. Now we said yield curves, and I'll give you a little example here. We'll do some, let me grab one from right now. Let's see. I'm going to go to my, my source here. I'm going to grab it from, uh, I'll grab Guru Focus's yield curve, and I'll just do a quick kind of um, chart here. I know we talk about the yield curve occasionally, but you really, you should look at the yield curve every day. And we'll do it right now. We'll do it live. Let's put it on here. 
and we'll add another slide for it. We'll call it yield curve time. Here we go. So uh, here's what the yield curve looks like right now. Current is the blue line. February 2021 is the darker gray. Uh, February 2020 is the lighter gray. I apologize for the different shades of gray. Uh, but in this scenario, one month to 30 years, this is government borrowing costs. And when we think about treasuries, treasuries, when the government spends more money than it has, <laughs> as, is, as has happened in every year for the last 26 years, <laughs> we, uh, end up <laughs> we end up issuing bonds. And bonds are a way for us to issue debt. And so bonds are a form of debt where we as investors become the banker. And, uh, you know, and the government borrows money from us to help pay their debts. If nobody wants to buy or take on the government's debt, then the government has to charge higher interest rates for debt. A typical or normal yield curve is upward sloping. So right now we have very low short-term rates. The Fed sets rates at time zero, overnight lending. But our one month rates, three month rates are gradually, gradually more expensive all the way out to 30 years. The, the reason you would have more expensive longer term rates, you can probably guess. If you want to invest in something for 30 years, you have to be compensated for taking on a great deal of long term risk. And, uh, and what this means as well is also that remember that you're not logged into that bond. You don't have to keep that bond forever. Bond markets, just like equity markets, you can buy and sell bonds like you buy and sell stocks. Equity markets, though, it's easier to do so for casual investors. You have uh, uh, you know, the NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange. Bonds are much more uh, 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 disparate. Uh, they're <laughs> Bond market buying and selling is often conducted through the medium of brokers. But uh, in this case, current, like, well, so is stock market, really. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of sources for bond market. Uh, but anyway, the current, um, the current yield curve is upwardly sloping. Now, imagine for a second, and what's happened for uh, all the recessions that we've had since the, the late 1970s has been that a what's called an inverted yield curve has predicted in a, a recession. We had an inverted yield curve in February 2020. We had high short-term rates and low long-term rates. So before we actually, and remember February 2020, that was the last month of the before times when we skipped through the park maskless. And, you know, we tell people tales, I tell my son tales of this time. And he doesn't, he doesn't, he thinks I'm making it up. Like it's like a, a fairy tale. And I'm like, no, it was true. We were careless. I, I saw a person sneeze once, I tell him. Uh, but anyway, but we had, a, we had a situation back then where we had an inverted yield curve even before the pandemic dating back to 2019. And this inverted yield curve, despite the fact we didn't know how a recession was gonna happen, successfully projected, predicted a recession in March. Now, if we raise rates really quickly on the left-hand side, so if those rates go up and we have five yield rate increases, that puts the left side of this blue line right about at the 1.5% level if we get five increases this year, about 1.4 probably. So if we hit five rate increase in the year, the left-hand side of this will be towards the left, towards this one and a half percent number. Now, how the market responds in the rest of the yield curve makes a big difference. If the market feels that the rate increases have made somehow us more likely to enter a recession, the yield curve might invert. 30-year rates could come down and it could be flat as a pancake. Or if the market is still growing strong, excuse me, we have robust numbers, the market has cause for optimism, we can still maintain higher 30-year rates. But the hard part is, is what it's going to look like in a year from now. And if it's flat, that means you should look for a recession in the next year or two, in 2023 or 2024. So things to look out for in the world of finance. All right, do you guys have any questions about stuff? A lot of good information here. So, um, yeah, what do you, did you you mentioned um, you mentioned how rising interest rates might uh, might uh, change mm. how this housing market goes too, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. to your point, that's a really good question, Albert. That's a really really good question. Mm -hmm. How will yeah. rising rates? How will rising rates affect the housing market? So. The interesting thing is, and you'll talk to every mortgage banker and they'll say, you know, mortgage rates don't follow the federal funds rate. They follow a different treasury rate, which is the 10 year rate, <laughs> which is this one over here. Mm. So uh, where the 10, when the 10 year rate goes up, mortgage rates go up. And when the 10 year rate goes down, mortgage rates often go down because mortgages are a form of long-term investment. So it moves like other long-term things. 
And so when we raise rates on the short end, that doesn't have a direct effect on the tenure, but it does put pressure on the tenure to increase. Because you have to ask yourself, if you're looking at this from an investor's perspective, let's take it, let's take it broadly for a second. Let's do an example. Let's say you buy a treasury bond at a short-term rate of one and a half percent. What is the worst thing that can happen to you? Okay, so let's say we enter a recession, but you bought a short-term, well, actually, maybe not a short-term bond, maybe uh, let's say a two-year bond at one and a half percent in a couple in you know a couple of years from now. If rates drop across the board, the price of your bond will go up. People will want a bond that pays them one and a half percent because the right, the new bonds might only be giving them half a percent. But if rates go up further and you buy a bond early, that's gonna drop the price of your bond. So you're stuck with a low interest rate. And if you try to dump it or sell it to someone else, then you'll end up in a situation where you will have fewer, uh, uh, where your bond price will drop, you'll have a capital loss and you could lose some money from that. So, so it's an interesting game, the bond market, when we think about these rates and especially 10 years and 30 years. And when we look at locking in cash flows. Um, you know, there is an incentive for mortgage rates to go up in accordance with these rates, because to incentivize bankers or people to keep the mortgage market liquid, uh, uh, it is important for um, banks to feel like they're at least getting a positive return on this. Um, the worst case scenario for banks is if rates come up a lot very quickly and they're trapped with a large number of credits that are only netting them one or two or 3% when prevailing interest rates are four, five, six, and 7%. Um, and they, won't, they don't wanna hold on to that, 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 that very, I mean, it can be safe debt and there's reasons to hold on to it, but uh, it's, it's harder, it, it creates some interesting, weird incentives for banking. So, so there's a lot of issues at play when we think about this. It's a really good question. It's a really, really good question. Yeah. yeah. Well, these are very good. Um, I don't see any questions here on Facebook. I've seen some people join in. Mm -hmm. um, any questions from the attendees over on this side? If, if, if you're looking at the job market and how everything's been mm. with what happened in January and what yes, yes. was um, derived upward in the past few months, um, you know, what are, what are your tips for professionals looking for yes. their next opportunity at this point? Yeah, I, and if I'm you're a, in a job and you like yeah. your job a lot, but you're just looking at all the opportunities out here too. Yes. What's, uh, what, what are your next steps okay. there as well? So I'll use a research-based answer to that question, Albert. So we've studied this question and this is a really good one. So, um, so first, one unfortunate fact about the labor market is the true way to increase your long-term worth to get paid what you should be paid is to change jobs, period. And that's an interesting thing. We see that people who change jobs have positive or higher income outcomes than people who remain in the same job. And there's a lot of reasons for that, right? So we might feel trapped in the same job. We might want to, you know, there's a lot of other things. We, we're fixed into a wage rate and expectations. We choose comfort over those things. Because right now, there is no recession on the horizon. Uh, one of the fears in changing jobs is, of course, you're, you go from being an experienced professional with years of experience, making it very difficult to uh, fire, to someone who's sort of the, even uh, uh, as an, if you're an older person, you're the new kid on the block, so to speak, right? And so then you have this, this, this situation where, where, where you have to build enough credibility to make sure, or e at least get through your probationary period in a way that you won't uh, be unprepared for the next economic downturn. So those two facts are very important, and I want them to guide you in your processes. Look at how much you're worth right now. If you are being underpaid relative to where you feel you should be, it is an advantageous time for you to search for another job. And if you find that job, it is still enough time for you uh, to uh, uh, gain enough credibility before the next recession. Uh, so that's kind of my, my bottom line, Albert, and and because it's always hesitant, you know, right before a recession when there's an inverted yield curve. And if you look at the yield curve and it's inverted, then you should start being a little bit more cautious. <laughs> that's what mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Other questions? <laughs> Again, no such thing as a silly question. I love questions. <laughs> Great questions. Um, how much, uh, I guess our, our next inflation numbers, I think probably mm. come out next week or the week after. <laughs> yes. And so at what point does 
the rate of inflation becomes so bad that we just, you know, every all this good economic news just becomes moot. <laughs> That's a good question. So, what at what point? What is the critical number? What is the number of despair, Albert? Is sort of speak, which mm -hmm. which I look at this inflation number and go, Riley's presentation is meaningless. An hour on my Friday night, I'll never get back because this inflation. So here's what we got. So in short, the answer is is that so inflation is likely going to continue to be high. Uh, but think about what factors enter into the inflationary regime. The consumer price index is a representative basket of goods and services that people buy, right? So in goods, so for instance, it's your it's your groceries, it's your housing, it's things like this. And so and so there's a couple of things. So we see, Housing pressure is going to ease. We see that used car pressure uh, uh, recently, used cars, um, both uh, from the people on the ground and other places, there's been fewer people buying used cars. Consequently, that's reduced the, the upward price pressures on used cars. We know that used cars were actually a big segment of that initial inflationary number. On the other hand, we saw another surge in oil prices. And I'll actually, I wanna show you all a chart to, uh, let me see if I can get this going here. We have, uh, we have a seven year high. So let me just grab our, an oil price chart. I can copy in real quickly for you to get a sense of this. Oil being not only a, a critical expense for anyone who you know, has to drive and other things, but also within um, the context of commodities, a very, important, um, a very important value. So let me get, I'm gonna grab the WTI. There's actually two worldwide global oil prices that we look at that gauge price. One of them is the West Texas Intermediate Level, which is decided in Cushing, Oklahoma, uh, uh, in the United States, uh, which shows us uh, the, um, uh, the, the price of oil often, and it's used most often in the Western hemisphere. Internationally, they use Brent, uh, which is a different gauge of oil prices. And so I'm gonna kind of uh, print screen this real quick and I'm, let me get that in front of you because this, to answer Albert's question, this is really, this is, this is, this drives, this will be driving the inflation number a little bit higher than we would have thought because we thought that inflation would ease off in spring. Whoa, there's a lot of windows open. Let me grab a little bit one here. Let's put this too much copy paste. Let's put this here. This is just from Market Watch. So crude oil right now is, is, is at this seven year high. You can kind of see this on the right hand side. It's this perfect storm of sort of high economic demand for oil. We know that in the long run, you know, clean energy is the thing, but in the short run, uh, uh, most people still drive vehicles with, with that need gas and oil. And so oil consumption remains high and prone to international shocks, AKA like the sort we see in Ukraine and Russia right now. So if we go back seven years, this is the highest price of oil that we've seen in seven years. And, um, and, and from 20, and, and, and it's likely that there is, <laughs> it's not likely we'll see $200 oil, but it's likely that it could remain elevated for a bit of time that will help build inflation. So to answer your number, I get worried if it hits the double digits, which I don't expect it will hit. I'm actually gonna point it out that that remains, that's a sub 5% prediction, Albert, mm -hmm. but, uh, I mean, in, you know, in the middle of the above. pandemic, they were literally paying you to store oil in your backyard. You know, and you remember that May, May of 2020, we had a uh, oil prices drop precipitously. We closed the economy, uh, and that re that 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 means demand dropped precipitously. So people holding oil contracts couldn't get rid of them before uh, 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 low enough. People were actually paying people to get rid of oil contracts because when you trade oil futures, which are legally binding contracts uh, for for su for supply and delivery of oil at a future date, um, but they're open to a lot of speculators. So when you speculate and buy, say a future futures contract, um, some people, and there's always the story, some people are left holding the bag uh, at the very end. No, they couldn't find a buyer for their contracts at the last minute who could actually supply the oil. And consequently, they ended up in a position where they, where they were now legally obligated to, to deliver somebody oil in that market. And uh, oil prices dropped. The futures market pressure was so high, it dropped to negative levels in May, negative 37, uh, as low as it went. Uh, for the price of oil, um, but figuratively, it was it was really uh, in the practical terms about you know in the in the twenty dollar range. But uh, uh, it's interesting when we look at this in context because we compare inflation as a year on year variable, and we're comparing oil as part of gas gas within within this commodity within our our CPI spectrum. This is part of our year on year change, and so oil's continued rise has made 
has put more upward pressure on inflation. But at 10%, it's very hard uh, uh, to deal with inflation. And consequently, it's very hard. The Fed will have to be much more aggressive about rate hikes. That could put us into a recessionary environment. The risk of the Fed uh, overcompensating becomes much greater. So I would say that if it still ends up approximate to where it was, I wouldn't worry. So in the 6.5% range would be OK. But uh, if it's higher than that, or that makes me a little bit more nervous. And at 10%, I, I start freaking out. So Albert, that's a good question. <laughs> Given the level of stock market volatility, do you think the Fed would ever reverse course and say, uh, you know, we're just, we're not going to do this. Um, it looks <laughs> like there's a lot of crazy stuff going on right. here with, right. with, but uh, yeah. Let's chat about that. Let's do some. Okay, let's chat about let's chat about the market so far. So yes. So in short, we've had some interesting volatility levels relative to where we were before. So one way we can measure there's all these other things. Let's talk about. Let's. Oh, this is great. That's a, that lines me up for a couple of cool graphics. Uh, Albert. So yeah. um, so the first graphic. I'm just going to pile these it's graphics on top of graphics. It's you know we're just going <laughs> to actually make a new slide here. Let's just make this. I could just, we'll just start doing it this way. So anyway, so one way we gauge volatility overall is, is, is we have a volatility index that is computed from the Chicago Board of Trade, uh, which is called the VIX. And you've heard about this if you are a fan of finance memes and other things, you've heard about the VIX. Uh, but the VIX is, is a, a way to gauge market volatility because what it does is look at options contracts and, and looks at, you know, um, you know, it tries to gauge you know, uncertainty within the market, within volatility levels. And to your point, um, so Albert, it is true. We, we've had some local volatility spikes recently and they've been concentrated heavily in tech sector stocks, which are, which are magnified because everyone owns them in the Bay Area or works for a company that, that possesses them. Not, that's a hyperbolic statement. But, but I mean, overall, when you think about this, it is higher than it was. We went through a period from basically 2012 to mid 2019 basically until the pandemic, almost. I'm almost 2020, basically, uh, of, of relatively low volatility. We're recovering very, very steadily. Things were happening. And then the pandemic hit, volatility shot up. Volatility represents uncertainty. But the thing with volatility is this is showing us market volatility. The Fed has, you know, even as, as Jerome Powell or, or, you know, as people in the Fed have looked at, has what's called traditionally a dual mandate, even if they depart from it. So which means that the Fed is focused on achieving two things. Um, traditionally, it's keeping full employment. And the second thing is keeping um, inflation relatively under control. Now, what Jerome Powell is doing is part of a more modern trend in economics we've seen in general, where people have looked at um, economic policy and said, you know, sometimes it's better if we can maintain some moderate inflation over a, a short run if we can still maintain economic growth and, and the benefits outweigh the cost. Now, what the Fed isn't in charge of is the stock market. The stock market, as we know it, are these are companies that choose to be publicly traded. Um, they, uh, as a condition of being publicly traded and fairly valued by investors, uh, uh, they have to report to the SEC, they have to do a lot of financial statements, um, and they have a lot of other, other conditions and other rules and, and obligations that apply to them. Now, the market itself, though, is a part of everyone's life, even if you don't foresee it that way. If you own a 401k, it's certainly part of what you're invested in. And um, if I look at, and I'm going to show you something, that's going to show something called the price to earnings ratio. One of the important metrics of how we value a company is some, or how we value the market or whether we consider it's overvalued or undervalued is something called the PE ratio. And I'm going to show you this here. Let's see if we can bring it up here. There we go. So this is not, I'm not sponsored by Lego, but I do buy my son a lot of Legos. So I suggest this is a targeted ad. Uh, but uh, one thing he does, he's, he builds these, these magnificent, you know, things. I'm like, your focus is incredible. Uh, but he's not a doctor. Uh, but one day soon. No, he'll be, a, he'll be a, he can be any type of finance professor you want. No, if we look at the finance, no, whatever it was, the PE ratio shows us the price of a stock over how much it makes, earnings per share. And the idea being is a stock price should fall within a certain window. It should fall uh, uh, with a certain ratio of price to earnings. Earnings per share is net income divided by the number of shares that a company makes. 
So if the price to earnings ratio is really, really high, it suggests the market is overvalued. And if it's really, really low, it suggests that it's undervalued. But there's also more to it. There's incentives in the market in different ways. So this is a chart that goes back to 1880 and goes up until today, up until literally today on this chart. And you can see it. We follow through it. We had this period of, uh, of, of challenges after World War I, followed by the Roaring Twenties, leading up to 1929, Black Tuesday, then a Great Depression. Nobody wanted to buy the stock market in 1933. And then we had a uh, wartime boom. The Econ economy started going up again. And then we had the post-war boom in the 50s and 60s. But wait, uh, we, had, we were under uh, uh, the United... We, we were under the... Um, uh, the Bretton Woods regime, where the US dollar was the only currency convertible to gold and every country had to own the dollar. So this encouraged uh, 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 you know, the growth of our economy worldwide. And then the 70s and 80s happened. We got off, we couldn't afford, uh, uh, the Bretton Woods system was suspended. We ended up with a period of high inflation. When inflation is high, people can get a lot of money by buying bonds, so they don't buy bonds. So they, so they buy bonds, I'm sorry, rather, rather than buying stocks. And so the price to earnings ratio is really low. But then, you know, beginning in the 80s, we had this upward swing up to 2000 in the tech bubble. Remember the tech bubble where everybody was buying stocks for companies? Everyone knew the internet was important, but nobody knew the difference between Amazon and pets.com. We didn't know which one would be big and which one wouldn't be big. And so everybody put money in different things. And that meant that shot up the price for different stocks, and yet they didn't earn money. And so their price to earnings ratio is really high. Enter the 2000s, our Great Recession in 2008, we dipped again, and then up since that time period, we are now at the highest price-to-earnings ratio across our market that we've seen since the year 2000. This suggests to proceed with caution, but it's also a function of borrowing rates that make it very hard to invest in things that aren't stocks. When the Fed rates are really, really low and the market is flush with cash, you want to put your money in a place that generates a return even if you accept a greater amount of risk. And that's why people invest in the stock market. So as rates go up, the cure to this is the price to earnings ratio will likely come down, which means the stock market will come down. Uh, but then that question, but we don't know, that's the long-term thing is higher rates usually mean downward stock market prices. But right now we're about double. Our long-term average is around 20. Although since uh, the 1980s, it's really been more <laughs> up and down. But uh, uh, 25 or higher, but it's a function of borrowing costs and where people, an opportunity cost, where people can invest and put their money to generate a return. Oh, goodness. Excellent. <laughs> Sorry, Albert. So anyway, the long story short is proceed with caution. The market is very expensive, but it doesn't mean it can't go up to a price to earnings ratio of 50, but it's just, it's hard to maintain it at that level. And we don't have data on that. And also it's unlikely rates can't get much lower than, than where they've been. So. Could you do negative rates? Sure. I mean, this is the thing. So they, this is a, okay. Okay. I like Could that you question. be Germany or Japan and, you know. Yeah. So, so when you think about negative rates, you're thinking about, can the market trade at negative rates? So on our yield curve example, this is a really good, I'm sorry. I'm getting really, I'm getting nerdier as this talk goes on. And I, I, <laughs> like I really try hard to be like, I am a normal human being doing human things. And I'd like to, I would like, tell me about your lives. And I really, you know, I'm going to nerd out here for a second. This is great for a second, for a lifetime. So uh, let me go on this. So if we went back to our, oh, I deleted our yield curve, but that's okay. But this is, you can imagine it. Anyway, just imagine it's a polar bear and a snowstorm. Uh, imagine a yield curve, uh, a yield curve in this case. So imagine for a second, uh, to answer your question, like will we, and, and, and let me get this right here, uh, uh, Al Albert. Can you ask your question one more time so I can answer it correctly? What about negative interest rates? Uh, so could you be paid to you know, right now? <laughs> the fun part about this was before the last 15 years or so, barring a little bit of shenanigans that happened in Switzerland in the 1970s, uh, uh, negative interest rates were theoretical. <laughs> we didn't think anybody would trade at that level, nor did we see it. But rates came down across after 2008. And then we started seeing individual companies, to your point, particularly Germany, for instance, uh, their bond yields started trading at negative rates. And so there's a lot of interesting things about this, right? So why would a 10-year bond trade at a negative rate? Why would somebody buy a bond and get less money in the future for it? And there's a lot of reasons why people invest in anything in finance, their risk and return. Uh, the biggest and most interesting part about this is they might be worried about losing money, more money in other places. 
Would you rather lose 1% or would you rather lose 10%? Uh, also, we have, we have the question of currencies, the question of value. And we know that um, in many cases, obviously it's good for governments because that's effectively, it's free borrowing for governments is, is an incentive for them <laughs> to borrow more. But, uh, 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 but at, the, at the overnight lending rate, right? So the Fed has set rates at zero because it represents a limit to what they can do from a monetary policy perspective. Um, it is possible to construct a negative rate regime if, like, the Fed could set short-term rates below zero, uh, and, and they, they can't really right now, but hypothetically, they could do so, but that would require, and, and I think the easiest way to consider that is if we had uh, more digital, if we had a digital currency. Uh, many economists argue that uh, one benefit of a digital currency is that it does allow uh, potentially unlimited uh, uh, rate um, power for a Federal Reserve to raise and lower rates. Um, it's harder to do with a paper currency without being digital. Um, and so that's why when you see negative rates, it's always on the two-year bonds, the five-year bonds, the 10-year bonds that are not determined by the Federal Reserve of that country, but they're determined by market supply and demand for certain things. And the market will bid up or bid down and buy negative, um, negative bonds are possible. In the United States, it's possible. Um, and we've had real negative returns for quite some time now, actually. So net of inflation, you're still losing money on these bonds. But you buy the bonds because they represent a steady stream of cash flows. You buy the bonds because they represent a safe haven, uh, because the United States is considered uh, to have no default risk, which might or might not be true, depending on if we raise the debt ceiling. Uh, but uh, but you get a sense of these of these of these things overall. So so overall, it is possible. But the only way you can do it from a, like an official policy standpoint is 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 if we went over to a digital currency, which would be very hard for a lot of people from a from like a personal preference standpoint. As a theorist, I'm like I love I love the idea, but like from people who we still have pennies, right? And the penny cost about. To make a penny, it's about 1.8 cents uh, to make yeah. a penny. We lose, I mean, it's ridiculous. I was just talking to an auditor of the US Mint the other day, and it was fascinating. I'm like, how do you account for these changes? Anyway, uh, so Scott asked from the Schiller PE ratio, now 20 years after the 2000 tech bubble burst, is the US market rising now with an appreciation of both recover quickly from the COVID-19 global pandemic and the general concept of focusing our support for our businesses on domestic concerns in lieu of having focuses that include international markets. What an interesting question, Chad. That's a really good one. So, so is the US market rising now with an appreciation? It is rising with an appreciation of recover quickly from the pandemic. We've actually never, and this is the interesting part, this is a supercharged recovery. It was a supercharged economic loss followed by a supercharged recovery. Um, so and in so, the longer term, it's kind of right. that U-shaped curve, right? That mm. maybe people were talking about at the very beginning. Right. Did it end up looking like a U or like a K, or did we just? You know, it's really that? if we if we if I'm being reasonable about sectors, it's really more of a K. But uh, but it is yeah. it is <laughs> it is slowing a little bit. It's more of a I don't know. <laughs> it's more of a series of W. It's like a yeah a series. It's like a W, but like if you're really like. Like a V, but if you're if you're really flamboyant about the other side of the V, if you're like V in one of those, and that's what it looks like. Uh, but Scott's but Scott's other point on this is really interesting because we're looking at the question of of international markets and, and how that that. So I would actually say that so this is a really interesting factor, Scott, because what's happening in the U.S. markets is mirrored globally. Money flows throughout markets, places, areas, investments. So consequently, um, many of the characteristics you see within our own economy, from the uh, uh, growth of certain sectors to the um, labor shortages are mirrored to unemployment rate to uh, 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 everything else is, is being mirrored among especially other developed countries worldwide. Um, the idea that we, that we can separate ourselves from international markets is, even if we 
built a wall around ourselves. We're so reliant on international commodities, our, our import export market, our, our current account balance, everything, our international flows of, of currency and demand. And, and even the mere fact that the largest currency trading market in the world is still in London. Uh, all of this is, is uh, uh, you know, um, it is amazing how much economies look like each other, I would actually argue in many respects. So although our policies have made the US economy recover quickly um, and certainly quicker than other less enthusiastic Federal Reserve banks like the ECB and other places, um, we're still running up on, on similar labor issues, similar demand issues. And, and we see the same echoing across the world, so to speak. So, so what does that mean? You know, our focus is domestic, but we still, and I would actually argue, you know, disproportionately so, have an influence on world policy. Um, and, and not only merely because the dollar still remains a, a de facto reserve currency worldwide, you know, oil is priced in dollars, for instance, and, and obviously that's a reason that many countries hold dollars, among other things, and that's a relic of the Bretton Woods system. But the, the, the fact that we have, um, and actually, if we go back to markets, and we just look at markets itself, you know, we don't have post-war U.S. dominance across the world anywhere, but we have global, our equity market is literally half of the world's market capitalization uh, for equity, which is why people write papers about the U.S. market solely about the U.S. market, regardless of whatever country that professor comes from or where they live or where the journal might even be located, because it's the deepest, broadest, and most wealthy, liquid stock market we have. And so when we talk about global markets, the US is half of that still. And I, that's not sustainable in the long run, of course, because of the growth of other economies and countries and things. But, but the fact that it's 2022 and I can still make that statement surprises me. And it surprises people because it's disproportionate to our even GDP size relative to the world or our population size. So it's interesting. So we are, we have the biggest market, yay. But also one <laughs> that means that we have <laughs> for us, but also one that we become, you know, um, it's impossible to shelter our exposure from international areas. Even when our focus is on domestic, we have, we have our international exposure is, is gargantuan. Um, and the way that we wag the rest of the world is, 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 is really interesting. You know, it won't always be that way, of course, but it's, uh, it is something, it is an observation that you have to be keen of. And, and whether or not we, are indeed a sort of a giant standing on clay legs or, or whether we're, you know, uh, more robust than we're given credit for. We'll, 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 the next 10 years, we'll see. Cool. Uh, anything else? Well, uh, we are <laughs> at the uh, hour and a half mark here. So um, I think if anyone has any questions, they can definitely reach out to you, Dr. White. Yes, of course. And so again, we want to thank you for coming on here. We'll think of an, another interesting topic next month to see what happens here during the month of February. Um, I'm sure there will be plenty, probably maybe another supply chain update. And I really love that goblet. I think that goblet is great. <laughs> it's the joblet. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, the and joblet. We'll six call it the joblet. <laughs> it's good. And it makes, so, it makes and water so taste so better. We... <laughs> exactly. And so as we, as we uh, conclude on this Friday afternoon, Friday evening, what, what is your biggest takeaway and how should job seekers go into the next, next month before we meet again? Good. So the first thing is, is the market with twice the number of jobs open for every unemployed worker. Um, it is robust. You, not all sectors are the same. In highly competitive areas, it might not be that way. It is worth always, though, in the long-term perspective, especially if you're not worried, if you're in a position where um, a recession isn't forthcoming, if you want to maximize your market value um, and you're unable to get a raise, especially in an inflationary environment, a, an increase in wages from your current employer, do look elsewhere. Do explore, look at, use resources, update your resume on Albert's list and, uh, and, and use some of the resources Albert posts, but, but also just shop around, especially if you have a job, it is worthwhile and it's worthwhile to do it now. Um, because ultimately I can't tell you, next year it doesn't look like there'll be a recession, but when there is the prospect of a recession, then people's jobs become more vulnerable and, and the uh, consumer confidence drops and they're less eager to go and search for other things. So, so be confident, this is a good job market. 
um, in general, consider those things. And, and, and also, if you feel like you're undervalued where you are, um, um, seek other places and, uh, and you'll do great. And I'm, I know I'm so grateful for your time today and, and, and genuinely anybody who wants to listen to, to me talk for an hour and a half is amazing. <laughs> um, so thank you, genuinely. Thank you so much. Good, good sound words. And with that, we will leave you all to your Friday evenings and a month ahead, and we'll see you all again soon. Thank you so much. You can always go to our Eventbrite page for our events, uh, our upcoming events and webinars, workshops, as well as a career fair, and we'll see you all soon. Bye, everybody.